Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for, for coming out, I, I believe, on a fairly short notice. Um, and I'm glad to, glad to see you all here. Uh, I will say that throughout my talk, if you have questions, do not be shy. Uh, the most enjoyable part of this sort of event is being able to answer your questions. Uh, and so that is, is primarily what I'm here to do. It's a topic that I'm going to share with you tonight that is just, I just think it's fun. Uh, and so that's one reason why I, I sort of jumped at the opportunity to talk about the outer solar system, which does not get nearly as much as much respect as I think it should. And I hope after tonight you'll come to appreciate the outer parts of our own solar system um, as well. We're going to begin, however, I think, with something a little bit more familiar, uh, but perhaps not, not too familiar. We'll get, we'll get to the familiar things in a second. This is a, a cartoon, and I was warned not to wander too far, a bit of a cartoon about how we think our solar system formed and how we think all other solar systems that we are now discovering form. And it's a process that begins with a cloud of gas in the interstellar medium. That is gas in between the stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. And under the forces of gravity, that cloud of gas will collapse. And if it has a little bit of rotation as it collapses, it will spin a little bit faster, and we should form a disk. And in the center of that disk, we'll find a central concentration that will evolve into the star. There. And then within the disks, the various things happen. And what we get going on from here to this stage is the conversion of gas and a little bit of, of micron-sized particles into slightly larger particles. These are things that we call condense out and form a little bit of solid. And then that solid begins to stick together and grow to larger and larger sizes. And we're left here with a disk that looks like this. And within the disk, you get these little, little particles, essentially small chunks of rock, perhaps small chunks of ice, various places in, the, in what is going to become our solar system. And over time, through a process of collisions, these will collide, these particles will collide, they will grow, and ultimately we'll have a set of larger objects we call planetesimals, which will be in that disk, and those eventually will form the individual planets that we know. That is, as I say, the cartoon of how we think our solar system formed. Lots of details we don't know, lots of questions remain about how exactly this works, when we observe other systems, are we saying the very same thing? But keep this picture in mind. When we start with this cloud, we end up here with something that we're going to call our own solar system. Now, one of the other things that's very important to what we'll talk about later is that within this disk, there's what we call a temperature gradient. It is much warmer in the interior part of the disk than it is farther out. And what that means is that if I get far enough away from the star, the solid material that can form is going to be ice. Whereas if I'm in the inner part of the solar system, anything that would have ice in it, it's too warm for that to form as ice. And so it remains either as a, largely as a gas, perhaps something as, as a liquid. So we'll have to keep that in mind as we go along. But let us start with something very interesting. And this isn't the comet that's been in the news quite lately, you may have heard about. This is another comet. Uh, this is Comet Temple 1. Uh, this is an image from a previous spacecraft that made a very close passage to a comet. Uh, did not try to land on the comet, as our European colleagues have done over the last couple of weeks. But this is what a, what a comet looks like up close uh, and personally. You can see it's very oddly shaped, appears to be sort of glued together, uh, which is what a, a comet is. And we think comets essentially are messengers from the outer part of the solar system. And so what you see here in a comet is some mixture of ice, a bit of rock, a bit of other material. And the real question is, what does that tell us about the origin of the solar system? And one of the very fascinating questions about comets, as I say, these are, have a lot of ice in them. Sometimes it's called a dirty snowball, um, because this ice mixed with a bunch of other stuff. And one question that is still unanswered is whether or not comets were responsible for bringing water onto planet Earth early in the history of the solar system. And so one of the experiments that the comet lander we hope to be able to do is to test the ice on certain comets, on this particular comet, to see if the composition of that water ice is the same as the composition of water that we see in the Earth's oceans, to see if perhaps water on the Earth did come from, from comets. 
So that's something that, that folks are working on. Here's what we call a spectrum um, of a comet. Many of you may have seen a spectrum. And if you take a spectrum of a comet, one of the things you notice is a very pre large presence of water. This is H2O. So if we take a spectrum of a comet, what we know is one of the things in there, quite a bit, is water. And, and what the fate of that water is and what impact it has had on the Earth is something that we're very interested in. But we'll get back to that. First, I want to start a little bit closer to home. Uh, this is an image, and it is, as you might imagine, false color. That is, it's, it's color enhanced, uh, so it's not the actual color your eyes would see or what the instrument would see, but it's been enhanced a little bit. Uh, this is an object, as you can see, it's fairly round, remarkably heavily cratered. Lots of craters like this, and it looks very, very familiar. Uh, and when I'm home in Wisconsin and I show this picture, I ask the audience, what object do they think it is? So I'll ask you, what do you think this is a picture of? So you're just like the good folks of Wisconsin. <laughs> you all said it was the moon. It's actually not the moon. I love tricking people. Now this is actually a picture of the planet Mercury. So the innermost planet in our solar system uh, that orbits the sun once every 88 days or so. This is what Mercury looks like up close. Uh, this is a picture taken from the Messenger spacecraft, which is actually in the midst of orbiting about Mercury, taking lots of images and doing lots of measurements. Fascinating looking place. Uh, and so another picture, this is also of Mercury. Surprise that, we, that, that scientists discovered. If you look at the edge of Mercury there, detected this little thing sticking off here. This is an up close <laughs> picture of it. It's actually what we call a plume, and it actually is a plume of water. So despite the fact that Mercury is very close to the sun, there are pockets of ice stuck in some of the craters. And that when they are illuminated by the sun, that ice will become water and essentially jet off into, into space. Mercury can be a very interesting planet. If we go beyond Mercury a little bit, we get to this particular planet. This is our twin. It is about the same size, the same mass as the Earth. This is the planet Venus. It's only about, oh, 0.9 times the distance from the sun that the Earth is. So it's a little bit closer to the sun than the Earth. The thing about Venus is it's very heavily cloud covered in clouds. The atmosphere on Venus is about 100 times thicker than the atmosphere on Earth. Other than that, it should be a twin of the Earth. Uh, science fiction writers in the early part of the 1900s loved to imagine that Venus was this warm, tropical paradise where dinosaurs roamed. Turns out not to be the case. What we now know is Venus has a surface temperature of about 700 degrees. And when it rains on Venus, it's sulfuric acid rain. Very, not a very pleasant place to be, despite the fact that it's first twin. And there is a radar image of Venus. This is a different technique astronomers can use. Essentially, it's firing a beam of radiation towards the planet, allowing that to bounce off the surface of the planet, and then detecting the reflection of that signal back with radio telescopes on the Earth. And through that technique, you can actually map the surface of the planet, measure how the terrain varies. And this is what we get for a picture of Venus through radar mapping. The white areas are a little bit higher up. The dark blue areas are a little bit lower. It's an interesting looking, looking place uh, radar-wise. This you should all be familiar with. This is our own dear planet. Uh, I'm sorry to say we are just off the edge of the picture of this planet. Earth is a great place. Remarkably unique uh, in our experience of looking at, at other planets. So Earth is what we call one astronomical unit away from the sun. And what you need to appreciate about astronomers is that we like to make our life easy. And so we say, how far away is the Earth from the sun? It is one astronomical unit. We will just define an astronomical unit as the distance between the sun and the Earth, just to make life easy. Okay? So keep that in mind. And it takes the Earth one year to go around the sun. Simple numbers. We love to make life a little bit, a little bit easier. Okay? Now, if we go out to one and a half astronomical units, so a little bit farther out, we get to this planet. Fascinating place, subject of, of much exploration and and fantasy, this is the red planet of Mars. Okay. What you see here is the largest canyon in the solar system that we know. It's about 3,000 kilometers. 
remarkable feature on the surface of Mars. Mars is also home to the largest volcano we know of in the solar system. It is not active, but it's about three times higher than Mount Everest. Give you a sense of scale. It's huge. Uh, Mars is a fascinating place for a lot of reasons. One is a fairly recent realization that's been confirmed over and over again over the last few years that once upon a time, Mars was covered with water. Once had a nice liquid ocean. The big questions that, that scientists try to answer now is what happened to all that water on Mars? And did the water last long enough for Mars to ever have life develop on its surface? And so one of the things that NASA, the, the American Space Agency, has been trying to do, the number of experiments, is to search for evidence of life on Mars, past life on Mars. We know, we're fairly certain there is no current life on Mars. There is still some hope back in 1976 very first lander landed on Mars. There was hope that it would turn on its cameras and see something skrill across the landscape, a bug, a spider, whatever. It was, there's a little bit of hope that maybe if we landed there, we would see something crawling around. So that's Mars, one and a half astronomical units away from the sun, so a bit farther away from so all these four objects that I've just shown you and talked about, they're all rocky planets. They're largely comprised of rock. So if you want to sort of imagine what the Earth is made out of, what Mars is made out of, what Venus is made out of, it is roughly silicon. Get a little silicon, get a few oxygen atoms together, put them together into a molecule, perhaps add a little magnesium, a little bit of iron. You have a silicate. That is largely what makes up the inner planets of the solar system. Varying amounts of iron, varying amounts of nickel, but largely rock. And so here's a schematic, uh, and this is a very, very, very unrealistic picture. Okay. Uh, this is to give you a sense of scale. There would be the sun. Each of these blue circles represents the orbit of a planet. So that would be the orbit of Mercury. There's the orbit of Venus, the orbit of the Earth, the orbit of Mars. And we are about to get to the orbit of Jupiter. All of these colorful dots in here are little chunks of rock called asteroids. And why I say this is a very unrealistic picture is that in order to be able to see the dots, the dots have to be so much bigger than an asteroid really is, this is unrealistic. And going from Mars to Jupiter, you, you can fly through there without running into an asteroid. It's not an impenetrable wall of, of objects that you have to Okay? So this is a bit unrealistic. But what we notice is that between Mars, outside of Mars' orbit, there's this huge distribution of a lot of asteroids, thousands of them. These are rocks that might be two, five, ten kilometers in size, orbiting about the sun. And so astronomers in the 1800s said, aha, look at this. We understand things now. There's this gap, mysterious gap, between Mars and Jupiter filled with these rocks. There was a planet there, and the planet exploded. That's how it um, Turns out that's not the case. Very likely it is just the debris left over from the formation of the solar system. Debris that did not manage to find its way into, into a planet. And so it remains asteroids. Um, how many of you are familiar with the story of Pluto becoming a dwarf planet? Some of you are. So about 10 years ago, astronomers in their wisdom decided that Pluto, I'll we'll talk about Pluto later on, was no longer a planet. It a demote Pluto, <coughs> not a planet, it became a dwarf planet. We'll talk about that. But back in the 1800s, when the very first asteroid was discovered, it was called a planet. It was the missing planet between Mars and Jupiter. And the only difference is that astronomers shortly thereafter discovered the second asteroid, and then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And pretty soon it became very clear that there are many objects in there, and so we could not well, no longer call them planets. We came up with another name and called them asteroids. It just took us a lot longer to find all of the other things out by Pluto's orbit. But we'll get to that story a bit later on. So I want to jump, jump a little too fast here. We're going to go from Mars, and now we're going to enter the realm of the outer solar system. Jupiter is about five astronomical units away from the sun. So five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And it's a very different place. This is a picture of Jupiter. 
And what we notice about Jupiter, first of all, it's very colorful. Okay? And it's got these bands going by. And it has this red spot here, the great red spot, which was first observed by Galileo in the 1600s. The red spot has been there for approximately at least 400 years, probably longer. It is a storm, much, very much like a typhoon or a hurricane, as we would call them in the northern hemisphere. It's a storm that has been lasting on Jupiter for centuries. Without end, it just goes around, spinning. It's about 10 times larger than the Earth. So can you imagine a typhoon that lasts for 400 years? Never goes away? That is what we have in the red spot. And it tells us something very interesting about Jupiter. Because the thing about a typhoon or a hurricane in, in the United States is that it builds up over a very warm ocean, and it gets a lot of energy from that warm water, and that energy causes this spinning to go around. And what does it do with that energy? It hits land and then deposits that energy, wind and rain, and it loses energy as it passes over land. There is no land for the red spot of Jupiter to pass over. There is no way for it to get rid of its energy. It is actually constantly getting energy from the atmosphere. And if we go a little bit farther around our solar system, up to about 10 astronomical years, so it's 100 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is, we run into Almost everybody's favorite planet. Everybody loves the rings. Everybody loves them. I mean, they're, they're, they're spectacular. When Galileo first saw them, he saw them, and then, then he looked again a, a little while later, a couple years later, and so they disappeared and, and thought Saturn had eaten the rings. They had fallen in, gone away. Um, Saturn is, of course, visible by the naked eye, so the ancients knew about Saturn long, long ago. Saturn has this very, very interesting property. The density of Saturn is slightly less than one gram per cubic centimeter. So yes, indeed, if you had a swimming pool large enough, Saturn would float. The rings, while they might look like solid sheets, are made up of tiny particles. Just lots of them in this nice flat distribution from rings. So those of you who are students, how many math students do we have? Any math students? A few of you, physics students? If you like problems of dynamics, the motions of particles and how particles interact, Saturn's rings are an incredibly wonderful laboratory for thinking about dynamics and how particles move and interact. It is absolutely fantastic. It's a great place to, to study these things. Here's another view of Saturn. Uh, this is taken by the mission Cassini. It's a satellite that has been orbiting Saturn for the better part of seven years now. Uh, this is a view from sort of the northern hemisphere of Saturn, looking down onto the planet. There's Saturn itself. There's the rings that you can see. Sunlight shining here. You see there's the, it's in the north pole of Saturn. Uh, fascinating place. It is a gas giant, as is Jupiter. Largest, con largest constituents of these planets is hydrogen and helium. And the interesting thing, if you think back to that first cartoon about the formation of our solar system, the chemical composition of Saturn and Jupiter match almost exactly the chemical composition of the sun. The sun and the giant planets form out of the same material, which is a bit of a confirmation of our initial model that we, that we talked about earlier. Okay. Another really nice picture. Saturn's just photogenic. So here is there, there's one of the moons of Saturn over there, a nice crescent. Um, and so you can see what, what Saturn looks like. Now, one of the neat things about Saturn is, is we, if we go back, uh, to the rings. The rings are actually very thin compared to, to their thickness, uh, to, their, to their width. Um, and so as the Earth orbits the sun, and as Saturn orbits the sun, there's a time about every 11 years or so where our vantage point, we see the rings edge on. And if you're looking at the rings completely edge on, they essentially disappear from view. Okay? Now, when I was about eight or nine years old, I did not know that. I just knew that Saturn had rings. And I thought they were always there. And so I had a little telescope when I was a kid. And I'd go out in the backyard, grow up, and I'd want my telescope at Saturn, but I thought it was Saturn. And I would look for the rings. And I didn't see the rings. So I looked at my maps again, and I said, where's Saturn? That's got to be Saturn. But like, man, there's no rings. It did not appear to be Saturn. A couple years later, I was out there again, trying to find Saturn. Hey, there's rings. 
And all I learned later on in life that we caught that particular year, caught the ring's edge on. There's no chance of this. But that was that was sad. Okay. Now this is a really this is this picture blows me away. I don't know think of that. Uh, this is a picture of uh, taken by the Cassini mission again, uh, unmanned mission, uh, or ring Saturn. And what you see here is the edge of the brightest parts of Saturn's rings. So if we go back pictures here, you'll see that Saturn has rings, and in a picture like this, it looks like it has an edge to it here. But we can look beyond that edge when you're up close and in the system. You can see that the rings actually extend much farther out. That's just a way that it's really remarkable. So that's one remarkable aspect of this picture. The other remarkable aspect of this picture is that little dot over there. That is us. That is an image of Earth taken from Saturn through Saturn's ring. So if you are out at Saturn, looking back at home, there's home. <laughs> right there. So here's an up close picture of home. Well, yeah, it looks more familiar now. But that is a picture of the Earth taken from Saturn. To give you a sense of distance, it's a scale. The communication time out to Saturn is about an hour and a half. It's the shortest time. Which means that if I send one of you out to Saturn and I say to call when you get there, so once you get to Saturn, you call them and you say, I, I made it to Saturn. An hour and a half later, those of us still here will hear you say, oh, I've made it to Saturn. And we'll say, great, how's the view? An hour and a half later, you will hear, great, how's the view? Now that seems, it's a long ways away, um, which I think makes the technological accomplishments of going to Saturn absolutely remarkable. The ability to send a spacecraft have it arrive at Saturn when you expect it to, and have it operate as you expect it to operate, and to be able to command it as Cassini has been commanding for the last decade is actually remarkable, given how long it takes to, to communicate back and forth. And we'll have another example of that in, in a minute. So if we go even farther out of the solar system, we now we're out at sort of 20 astronomical units. We come across Uranus. Uranus is not visible with the naked eye. You need a telescope to see Uranus. Just barely. You just need a telescope. So it was the first planet that was discovered. And the ancients knew about the other ones, but Uranus was the first one. What do you know about Uranus is it's very blue. It has not got its side, in the sense that it is not got its side and it's spinning like this as it goes around the sun, rather than spinning like that. Not quite sure why we make the assumption that early in the formation of Uranus it ran into something that knocked it on its side. I'm not quite sure how that, how that worked. We'll get back to Uranus in a, in a second. And then if we go even farther out, to 40 astronomical units or so, 40 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is, we come across Neptune. About the same size as Uranus, both are about 10 times bigger than the, than the Earth. Again, it's very blue. It has its own storm. Right there, that's been going a while. Um, <laughs> it is not knocked on its side. Now, we actually know very little about Uranus and Neptune compared to Jupiter and Saturn because we have only sent one satellite to Uranus and Neptune. The Voyager 2 spacecraft, which was launched in the 1970s, made it past Uranus in 1986 and Neptune in 1989 on its way out to the outer edge of the solar system, where it is still functioning. So for about a week, we had a little spacecraft flying by Uranus, flying by Neptune, sending back all sorts of pictures. And that's the best view we've got of, of these planets. Now, the blue likely comes from methane. Well, carbon, four hydrogen atoms stuck together, methane, and methane is a wonderful absorber of, of red light. And so what we see is the blue color. So the composition of Uranus and Neptune is a little bit different than Jupiter and Saturn. There's more methane. The other thing that are in Uranus and Neptune is probably much more water, much more water ice. Probably make up the interiors of these two planets. So sometimes Jupiter and Saturn are referred to as gas giants, and Uranus and Neptune will be referred to as ice giants. Okay? And we'll get back to that. So we had a little cartoon of what they might be made of. Here's Jupiter and Saturn over here. Ice and rocks deep down in the core, maybe we don't really know. Very hard to figure out how you would calculate it. It's hard to imagine why there wouldn't be something solid in the cores of those planets, but we're not quite sure. As we go out in both 
objects, there's a layer of so-called metallic hydrogen. That is, if I take hydrogen and I compress it enough under enough density, I will liberate the electrons. And so a hydrogen gas so compressed will act as a conductor. Electricity can flow through this metallic hydrogen. And if you have this conducting medium of metallic hydrogen and something like Jupiter and Saturn that spin once every 10 hours, in this really rapid rotation, and I have this conducting medium deep down, you're going to generate what we call a magnetic field. Just like the Earth has a magnetic field. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field in the solar system that's not in the sun. Really, really remarkable field strengths. And then on the outer layers, we will see some molecular hydrogen mixing with ammonia and a little bit of methane and things like that. The largely molecular hydrogen. That's what we think of the composition, the structure of these. If we go to Uranus and Neptune, Again, a question mark about whether there's rocks at the core. We think so. Very little evidence of that. And then probably some mixture of ice and rock in here, and then that molecular hydrogen methane layer at the top. That's the interior structure. None of the silicates, and if there are silicates, they're deep down here, that the Earth and Venus and Mars are there. Completely different planets. Okay? Completely different shapes, or not shapes, the sizes, completely different sizes and compositions in the outer planets compared to the inner planets. Okay. And just as a caution, for those of us of a certain age, we understood long ago how to make a planetary system. You make your small rocky planets close to the star, you make your big gaseous planets far away from the star, and it all made sense. Okay. Until we started discovering lots of other planetary systems that had big gaseous things very close to their stars. Um, and we had to try to figure out how to Now, one of the neat things about the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Earth, and is they have a lot of moons. And some of their moons are really remarkable places. And so I want to take a bit of time to, to show you um, and take a tour of some of the moons of the outer planets. So give me a sense of scale. Here's, here's the diameters of some things we're familiar with. Mercury, Earth, Pluto, the moon, our own moon. And then a bunch of moons of the outer planets, which we'll get to. Here are their densities. Mercury is fairly dense. Earth is up there a little bit. This is grams per cubic centimeter. Pluto is only about two. The moon, our moon, and Io are about the same. And then we drop down. We get around two or so grams per cubic centimeter. It's a total density of these objects. Okay? So a little bit less dense than objects in the inner part of the solar system. For those of you who are fans of, of Greek literature, you will know that Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto were the wives of Jupiter at various times. And so that's how they got their name. Uh, Triton is the thing that Neptune holds as, he, as he's going about his, his business. Okay, so here's sort of a photo gallery of some of the famous ones. Here's the famous four moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, in order from Jupiter. And if you ever want to remember the order, the thing that we would say is, I eat green carrots. And that is the way to remember <laughs> If we look at Saturn, Saturn has a bunch of small moons, and then there's one really big one, Titan. We'll talk about Titan in a minute. Uranus has this few dark moons. We know very little about the moons of Uranus. Very, very little, actually. Uh, they are, if you are a fan of English literature, all named after characters from English literature, most of which come from the plays of Shakespeare. And then there's Neptune, which has Triton as its largest moon, and there's other objects for a size comparison. Give me a sense of scale. There's the family portrait for Jupiter. It's four Galilean satellites. These are discovered by Galileo. Uh, he pointed his telescope at Jupiter. He noticed these four dots that seemed to move around Jupiter. It was a remarkable discovery. Because for the very first time, there's evidence that there was something out there in space that other objects went around. Up until that time, most people thought everything went around the Earth. There are some revolutionary ideas that maybe something around the sun, but that wasn't all accepted. The idea that, boy, there's something out there and other stuff is moving around it seemed to imply that the universe was not what we thought. So again, back here, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They all seem to go in the same direction. They all move in the same plane. Okay, that's what we mean by prograde orbits. They're all going around the same way. One of the important things to remember about our solar system by and large, there are exceptions to this, but by and large, everything in the solar system orbits in the same direction 
and spins in the same direction. So the Earth spins in the same direction that it is orbiting the Sun. That is the same direction that the Sun is spinning. It's the same direction that the Moon is orbiting the Earth. The same direction that the Moon is spinning. The same direction that Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn orbit the Sun. Largely in the same direction they spin, the same direction the moons and the big planets go around their orbits. So pretty much everything in the solar system is spinning and orbiting in the same direction. The exceptions are really interesting, but that's by and large a rule of, a rule of thumb, as we said. So the mass, the total mass of those four big planets is about the same mass of Mars. Okay? We've got a little bit of, of the heavy element of one, it's kind of similar to the sun, and extends 30 times Jupiter's radius, the Jovian system. Not quite like the sun. But there are some questions about whether the system of moons around Jupiter and Saturn is similar to, to scale to the solar system as a whole. Now one of the neat things that goes on in Jupiter's system are tidal forces. And this is gravity. And that is to say that if I have an object, for example the moon, the moon is exerting a gravitational tug on the Earth. The gravitational tug on this side is a little bit stronger than the gravitational tug on that side. So over the course of a day, as the Earth spins, it is spinning through these bulges of our liquid, and so we get tides. Because of the Earth spins, because of gravi the gravitational pull of, of, Mar of the Moon. The fact that it's different from one side of the Earth to the other. So the Earth rotates through these, these bulges in the water, and get tides twice a day as a, as a result of that. The same process probably works on the Moon. And so back in 1979, and for those of you who are scientists, this is fantastic stuff. Right? When you write a paper, when you make a prediction. So these authors made a prediction that the dissipation of tidal energy in Jupiter's satellite Io is likely to have melted a major fraction of the mass. Consequences of a largely molten interior may be evident in pictures of Io's surface returned by Voyager 1. Voyager 1 was a spacecraft that in 1979 was on its way to Jupiter. It had not arrived at Jupiter yet. And so based on some fairly simple calculations, these authors had concluded that those tidal forces that Io must feel were probably strong enough to melt the interior of Io. That is to turn rock into molten rock. And with the molten interior, we should see evidence on the surface. That was their prediction. So Voyager 1 got to Jupiter, took some very nice pictures, and this is one of the most famous ones that it took right when it got to Jupiter. This is Io, and lo and behold, right there on the edge of Io is a volcanic eruption. So in fact, Io is remarkably volcanic. Uh, it turns out that it is, I'll skip to my picture there, there we go. It is the most volcanic place in the solar system. It is molten, it is covered with essentially what we call geysers, Openings in the surface, molten material is oozing out or shooting out up into space. You can see a picture of it here. This is just all these geysers that we see on the surface of Io. There's flows of molten material on the surface. There really is very little that, that is solid that you'd want to stand on in the midst of all of this. And so it's because of these tidal forces that Io is so volcanic. Um, and as I mentioned, Here's a couple other pictures. This, the, the coloring's kind of weird here, but these are some hot spots showing you where there's active uh, eruptions on the surface, a few of them shooting material out into space. On the edge, you can see these, these volcanoes, these geysers, shooting material away from it. It's essentially boiling away as it uses material out of, this, out of this space, all because of these tidal forces at work in its interior. Oh, another nice picture of the ejections of material coming off the surface. So Io has no evidence of water, unlike all the other moons of Jupiter. We'll talk about water in a second. It has a huge heat flow. It's warm. It's creating lots of energy in the interior, and that's flowing out. Uh, and the tidal forces are probably uh, as a result of this. Okay. I'll skip over a lot of these, these equations. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's Io. If we go out to the next one, this is Europa. And so you can make the same calculation we made for Io to calculate that Io's interior must be molten because of all that tidal energy. And you can apply it to Europa and say, well, Europa is a little bit farther away than Jupiter. And so maybe the tidal forces are a little bit weaker. So maybe there's not quite as much tidal heating 
And so maybe it's not quite as molten, but if it has ice, it's probably going to be liquid. And so here's a nice picture of Europa. It's covered with ice. There's these nice cracks that run through it. But it's remarkable. And so when astronomers started thinking about Europa, notice that the surface was covered in these cracks. Notice the lack of craters on the surface of Europa. You see very, very few craters on the surface. Maybe there's one there. And that's an indication that the surface is very young in terms of some geological time scales. And you can ask the question, if I've got a surface of ice, that is cracked, and the surface is very young, that implies that there must be something that moves underneath that surface of ice and occasionally flows to resurface the planet. And the conclusion you reach from that is that Europa very likely has a liquid interior, and that liquid is very likely water. Good old fashioned H2O. So here's an image of, of the surface up close and, and personal. And for folks who study the ice in, say, the Arctic Ocean, that is studying ice layers over top of liquid water, this is very familiar. This is what that ice looks like. And so you can reach the conclusion that, yeah, there must be some water underneath this ice layer in Europa. How thick that ice layer is, we're not quite sure. It's pretty convincing evidence that underneath that ice layer is a liquid ocean. So there's a big question. Does it have a subsurface? subsurface ocean? The answer is probably yes. What accounts for those features on the surface is probably the motion of the ice driven by this liquid water. What's the chemical composition of that water? Are there impurities? That would be really interesting to, to learn. Okay? So if you take a spectrum of the surface of Europa, you do see water, so we know it's water ice. But as I say, the surface is very young. It has a strange magnetic field, which is kind of interesting. And so we draw the conclusion that Europa this was the first object in the solar system where sort of reached the conclusion that it had liquid water. Not just ice, but liquid water. This was the first object other than the Earth. That was pretty clear. And so here's a cartoon, artist's conception, of what it might look like. There's a, a layer of, of a bit of rock and ice, and underneath that is an ocean, and a casing material comes up. There's Io in the background shooting off its volcanoes. It's Jupiter. But that would be what I, or what Europa would look like. It would be absolutely fascinating to send a probe to Europa to drill down through that ice into samples of that water. Your folks actively thinking about how you might do that. You do worry about impurities. What if you bring something with you that you don't know is on your equipment and you end up polluting the water underneath there? So there's, there's concerns there. But it'd be absolutely great to go to Europa and test that, test that water. So here's another picture of what, what, what it might, might look like. I like this. This is warm ice and cold ice. Ice is just cold, but yeah, this is a little bit warmer. That's a little bit colder. I think ice is ice is ice. <laughs> okay, so if you want to go to Saturn, we're going to move on to Saturn. This is how you go to Saturn. Okay? How do you get to Saturn? Well, you, you start here on, on October 15th, 1997, and you launch your spacecraft from the and it goes on this little red line. And for some reason or another, you decide that the best way to go to Saturn is to go to Venus first. Okay. So there you go. You go to Venus. You swing by Venus a couple of times. And then you come back past, past the oh, wait, there, 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 there. And then you come past, past, past the Earth two years after you launched, August 1999. And that sends you in the right direction with the right velocity that you're on your way. You go by Jupiter about a year later. And then four, four years after that, you end up at Saturn. Okay? That is the trajectory for Cassini. Arrived in 2004, still working, arrived on time. Okay? The buses in Madison never arrive on time. <laughs> it's good history. But I could send something to Saturn and get there on time. Uh, so the great thing about Saturn, one of the really neat things about Saturn, is that Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan, so yeah, Titan was discovered in 1655. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. Ganymede is the largest. Um, that's all interesting, that's all interesting. The neat thing about Titan is it has an atmosphere. It's detected in 1944. Um, a little bit of methane, but other stuff. Carbon and hydrogen stuck together in various molecules. Voyager went by the detecting nitrogen, so the atmosphere is actually mostly nitrogen. Can you think of another object who has an atmosphere that is mostly nitrogen? Theory. 
It's pressure. The atmospheric pressure is comparable to the Earth's atmospheric pressure. Okay, this is getting interesting. You're telling me we have something out here that has mostly nitrogen in the atmosphere that's the same pressure as the atmosphere on Earth. That gets kind of fascinating. It's got this nasty stuff in the atmosphere. Because you don't want to breathe. But hey, it's got an atmosphere. Um, and so we think there's actually a methane cycle in the atmosphere. So the thing to remember about Titan is it is the only other object in the solar system. It's certainly the only moon in the solar system that has a permanent atmosphere. Mars also has a permanent atmosphere, as does Venus. But the only moon in the solar system with a permanent atmosphere is Titan. Uh, and it probably has a bit of methane and ethane rain and snow. It probably has a bit of methane or ethane liquid on the surface. You'll see pictures of it in a minute. So there's a, in a sort of a drawing of what the atmosphere might look like. Here's, here's our own atmosphere, Titan's atmosphere, nitrogen, methane, a bit of argon, possibly, maybe some photochemical haze, a little methane near the surface. It's a lot colder there, but it's got a really interesting atmosphere. For those of you who like organic chemistry, Titan is a wonderful laboratory for sort of free organic chemistry. It's got all the right molecules, all the right combinations of carbon and hydrogen in interesting ratios, all mixed together. Uh, so it would be an absolutely fascinating place uh, to do some more exploration. So there's a bit of a picture of the surface again from some radar mapping. Nice picture there. And so the Cassini mission had a little probe on it called, called Huygens. And the idea behind Huygens was to send it off and let it descend, 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 and land on the surface of Titan. Okay, Another remarkable achievement. So there's the landing spot. A little closer, a little closer, a little closer, boom. And so Titan successfully landed on, sorry, Huygens landed on the surface of Titan and took this picture. That's what Titan looks like. It's the surface of Saturn's largest moon. What they discovered was the ground was not too squishy, not too solid, kind of like solid sand. If you go to the, go to the beach, you know, it squishes a little bit, but not too bad. A few rocks. Um, again, this is a remarkable achievement, because remember, it takes at least an hour and a half to communicate to Saturn. And so if you're launching a probe, once you send that command to let the probe go, you have no control over what happens next. You can't steer it. You can't tell it to go left or right or slow down or speed up. You just hope that your imaging beforehand was really accurate so you know where you're going. Any computer programmers in the room? You hope your software is really good. Because it's all software. To make that thing land where you want it to land, how you want it to land. And it works. And this great image of the surface of Titan. Just a tantalizing taste of, of what it might be like to, to rove around. It'd be great to send a rover to Titan to sample some of the surface, to sample some of the, some, some of the liquid that exists there. Here's an image taken seeing what looks like a lake. Uh, here's probably ethane or methane. It is some sort of hydrocarbon. Uh, there may be evidence of past rivers on the surface of Titan. Again, this would not be water, but would be some hydrocarbon fluid. And here's a nice quote from the discovery paper from the lander. The surface was neither hard like solid ice, nor very compressible like a blanket of fluffy aerosol. Rather, the Huygens probe landed on a relatively soft, solid surface whose properties are analogous to wet clay, lightly packed snow, and wet or dry sand. That sounds very poetic. <laughs> it sounds like a really nice place to go. You'd love to go visit. A nice picture of, of, of Titan. And this is really a neat one uh, taken by Cassini. And the idea here is that what we're seeing up here is this reflection of the sun in a lake on the surface of Titan. Now that is cool. You know, to take that picture and think that that's the reflection of sunlight off of a liquid on the surface of Titan. <coughs> yeah, it's not water. You want to go swimming. It'd be great to, to explore. Another crazy moon of Saturn's, one of its smaller ones. And then Saturn has this other one called Enceladus, or Enceladus. It, too, is covered in ice, very much like Europa. It, too, has very few craters, very much like Europa. And it, too, has a bit of a thin atmosphere, comes and goes a bit. It seems to be warmer at the South Pole. It's got these so-called tiger stripes. And the notion was that maybe it, too, has a subsurface ocean. It would be warm, so we think. So there's a really nice, here's some of the tiger stripes. Again, this is familiar structures and features for folks who study how ice behaves when it's on top of a liquid water ocean. 
very familiar. A few more craters here than we see elsewhere. And then this spectacular image taken of the edge of Enceladus with all of these geysers coming out. This is water coming out of the surface. Very much like Io had geysers of molten material, the molten material on Enceladus is actually water. And so we know that the moons of Saturn, particularly Enceladus, has a lot of water in it. Again, it probably has a liquid subsurface ocean. What's in that ocean, we don't know. We can only sort of speculate. So just type it again. And so here, if you're designing an orbit and how you want to go about flying around Saturn and encountering all the moons and the rings, you plan your trip accordingly. <laughs> this, is, this is the flight plan for Cassini uh, up until, what is this? This is uh, 2013, okay? That's, that's great software to figure out how to make your spacecraft steer in this way uh, so that you encounter all the various moons exactly when you want to to get pictures up close to person. So if you, if you like that, I encourage you to go, go to the Cassini website. You will see just enormous numbers of fantastic images of the moons of Saturn. A remarkably well explored system. Uh, and let's see, as of April 2013, it had traveled, oh, good grief, 6.2 billion kilometers. That's a lot of mileage in a car. <laughs> I, I would need a new one after that. But see, he still works, still operating. It's absolutely fantastic. So let's go a bit farther along. We're going to skip over here because the moon's really kind of dark and we don't know much about it. We'll go to Neptune. Neptune's largest moon is Triton. And this is a picture of Triton taken by Voyager 2. Now, the thing about Triton, remember what I told you, that everything in the solar system goes in the right, same direction, spins in the same direction? Yeah. Not Triton. Triton goes around backwards. It goes around the wrong way. Uh, which implies that Triton was probably captured by Neptune. It's not born with Neptune. It probably was captured with Neptune. And if you think about the density of Triton and the size of Triton, and you say, well, I wonder what Pluto would look like if we could see Pluto. This is probably what Pluto would look like. Surface is, is kind of odd. It's got a few craters, not too many. It's got these dark spots, not too, not too many. Interesting surface. But this is what Triton looks like. Again, it goes around the wrong way. So those are our brief tour of some of the exciting moons of the outer, the outer planets. Fascinating places that require a lot more attention to answer some of the questions we want to know. What's in the water in Europa and Enceladus? What happens to Titan's atmosphere? How did it form? How does it evolve? How does it change over time? What's the climate like on Titan? What's the fate of Io and its volcanic activity? Lots of questions that we, we would still like to answer, and we don't know. There's plenty of work to be done, which is, which is fantastic. So if we step back, another schematic, and this is the picture I showed you earlier of the inner part of the solar system, but now we're going to have the same basic idea. Here's the orbit of Saturn, here's the orbit of Uranus, the orbit of Neptune, and then the orbit of Pluto. And that one right there. The dots that you see here are all smaller bodies. Some of them are comets. There's Halley's Comet. It comes about once every 87 years or so. Okay, that's its orbit. It comes swooping close to the sun, Heads back out, and it comes back. This was the confirmation. Halley's Comet would actually prove to be the confirmation of what Kepler, Johannes Kepler, and Isaac Newton had concluded. Kepler had concluded from looking at the planets that the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits, and he set up several laws, three laws that describe planetary motion. He didn't know the basis of those laws, but based on observations, he figured it out. Newton explained those laws by gravity. And the prediction was that we should be able to see Halley's Comet come back at the same time or when it was predicted to be. And Halley's Comet came back. And that was a confirmation of Kepler's laws and Newton's understanding of those. Um, for those of you that may remember, in 1995, we were visited by two comets, one called hale bopp and the other one called Hayakataki. This is the orbit of Hayakataki. It come, came in, swept close to the sun, and headed back out. And you can try to complete this ellipse in your mind. <laughs> there. Halo block is worse, OK? It came, came in, came close, and it's heading back out. And you can try to tell me where that ellipse is going to be. <laughs> way, way. Okay. These comets were a surprise. They were neither coming. They were both discovered right about the time they got to Jupiter. Basically, people like 
Basically, Hale and Bach, who had a career of looking for comets, discover it. If you want to get your name on an astronomical object, there's one way to do it. Discover a comet. <laughs> it will have your name. <laughs> Guarantee you, that's the way to do it. Anything else, we're going to put a number on it and not your name. Okay, sorry. But you discover a comet. Uh, that's the way to get it, get it named. Now, there's a bunch of other things that are labeled here um, as, as well, in, in addition to those comments. And these things out here, there's something called Forwar over here, you know, Orcus over there. We'll talk about some of these in a second. But that is the solar system when we step back and look from the far. Okay? Uh, what you need to keep in mind is that despite, again, the sizes of these dots, the solar system is mostly empty space. It is mostly empty space. We occupy, as we saw in that picture from Saturn, a tiny, tiny little speck in a vast, empty space. That is our, our solar system. So here's a kind of a crazy image. Um, what is up here is simply measurements of the brightness of an object. Astronomers have this very backward system of assigning the brightness to the two objects. Optical astronomy. Those of you radio telescopes have figured out that you actually use real units of real flux and you can actually measure it. Optical astronomers, we cling to these magnitudes. And the way magnitudes work, goes back a long time ago. If you go out and look up at the night sky and say, oh, there's the brightest star I can see, that's first magnitude. That's second brightest star over there. That's second magnitude. Okay, there's, there's third, fourth, and so on. So in other words, the larger the number, the fainter the object. Okay, that a 22nd magnitude object is a lot fainter than a fifth magnitude object. And so these are different objects, 23rd magnitude, all the way down to 28th magnitude, looking out with the Hubble Space Telescope to try to detect some things. And you go know, faint enough, or really faint stuff, you've got to add up a lot of data, and it's so you can find some, some smudge in the spec there. All this goes to show is that if you have a telescope and you stare into the sky deeply enough, you can discover a little speck. It's faint, it's really far away, it's small, but it's a little speck of the solar system. And what we call these things are so-called Kuiper Belt objects, because they exist about out here in the thing we call the Kuiper Belt. This is a distribution of objects that are kind of like comets. It's kind of like an equivalent of the asteroid belt, but at the outer part of the solar system rather than the inner part of the solar system. And it is in the Kuiper Belt that we began to see that Pluto might not, just, might not be as unique as we thought. So here's a cartoon of, of the overall structure of the solar system and how it might have formed. So here is, let's look at here, here's 100 astronomical units. That's what the solar system looks like on that scale. There's all the planets we know and love, 100 astronomical units. If we step out to 2,000 astronomical units, okay, our solar system is way inside there. There's this distribution of stuff. But if we go even farther to sort of 40,000 astronomical units, we still see what we think is a spherical distribution of material, little particles. These are comets, like Hale, Bob, and Hale at the top. Probably came from out here. And the stuff out here is the remnants of the formation of the solar system. If you want a sample of what the material was like that the solar system formed out of, get yourself a chunk of comet. And that's one reason you want to learn about to try to get a chunk of the stuff that the solar system formed out of. So if we go to the outer part of the solar system, so there's, there's Pluto. And I haven't thought about Pluto, because everybody knows Pluto. Pluto was discovered in 1930 by a guy named Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell Observatory in the United States. Uh, it, it was thought to explain Neptune's orbit, but it turns out there's nothing wrong with Neptune's orbit. Calculations are a little off, but Neptune's orbit was, was perfectly located. Um, in 1976, people in the United Spectrum of it discovered that it had a surface of, of, six, of methane ice. 1978, Folks discovered it in a six, four day period in brightness, and that was the discovery of its moon, Charon. Uh, for those of you that know your Greek mythology, Pluto is the god of the underworld. <laughs> to get to the underworld, you had to cross over the river Styx. To cross over the river Styx, you had to pay the boatman to take you across the river. The boatman's name was Charon. <laughs> so Pluto's moon, So here's the schematic of the orbits. Pluto's orbit has always been known to be odd. It is inclined with respect to the solar system. This arrow indicates it's actually spinning in the wrong direction. It seemed a little out of place, even when we thought it was a planet. So 
see a little bit more than that. Uh, through the Hubble Space Telescope, the telescope in orbit, get above the Earth's light, atmosphere. This is an image of Pluto. Now, Pluto is big after that. Now that's a city. Small, far away. You can't really make out a lot of surface features on, on Pluto. Okay. But there's enough variation that people speculate that there's different compositions to it. You can take a spectrum of it. You can see that it's made up of methane, a little bit of nitrogen, a little carbon monoxide, hydrogen, uh, water, ices. So again, it's ice. What did we see in the moons of Saturn? A lot of ice. And so the solid stuff in the outer part of the solar system is this mixture of rock and a lot of ice. <coughs> you see that. And it maybe has an atmosphere that comes and goes. So here's a spectrum of Pluto. You can take a nice telescope, point at Pluto, you get a spectrum, and all of these so-called absorption features are all methane. Again, it's confirmation the surface of Pluto is methane ice. That's the common material. If you want to know that Pluto has an atmosphere, you can do an experiment like this. You find some star, okay, and you sit here on the Earth, and you see Pluto, and you start your observations there, and you finish your observations there, and all the while you're staring at this star, and as you pass along this way, what you'll notice is that the star, if there's a bit of an atmosphere, a little bit of gas over the surface, you'll notice that because of its effect on the starlight. If it was just solid, you would expect to see the star and then see no star, and then the star would reappear a bit later on. But the fact that when you do this experiment, you see a little curvature in this line as the light of the star is there, and then it, it sort of gradually falls off, goes away, and the star comes back. It has that curvature to it, which implies that Pluto has a little bit of an atmosphere. Let's see, hey, Pluto's got a moon, it's got an atmosphere, and you're telling me it's not a real planet? That doesn't seem Nice image of Pluto. It's got a bit of an appendage. Okay, that was the discovery image for the fact that it had a moon. Uh, and so Charon, it's got this highly inclined orbit. Um, it is about 12% the mass of Pluto. Our own moon is about 1% the mass of the Earth. So the ratio of masses is very, very strange. The ratio of our mass of our own moon is odd, considering all the other moons in the solar system. The ratio of masses of Pluto and Charon is even odder. That off. And it's, you know, it's only half the size. It's a pretty not a huge difference. That's kind of remarkable. So, a better picture there's Pluto, there's Charon, just a couple of background stars, a fantastic image. So, yeah, look, but Pluto's got a big. That's kind of Well, Hubble Space Telescope kept staring at Pluto time to time. Um, and then, discovered in 2005, three days apart, there's Pluto. There's Charon. We knew about Charon. And there's these two other dots, <coughs> P1 and P2. Three days later, Charon has moved over here. P1 and P2, same separation, same orientation. But they've moved over that way, too. They've gone from this orient there to there. They're orbiting. They're orbiting Pluto. So Pluto not only has one moon, all of a sudden has three moons. Yeah, so now we have this thing. Pluto, small, strange orbit, and it has three moons. We only have one. <laughs> Venus doesn't have any. Pluto's got three. Okay. So there's a nice image of the Canada satellites. Uh, Jerks actually has another one, it's actually four over there. <laughs> so it's got four moons, as we, as we now know. So here's a, here is a map of sort of the system of it. And what you can conclude from, from the moons and knowing their motions around Pluto is that they actually do not orbit Pluto is that Pluto and Charon and Hydra and Nix, the names of these other two ones, all orbit the common center of the system, which is just outside the surface of Pluto. It's really, really strange. Our explanation of it, computer simulators love to do this sort of stuff. So one of the things that we now understand about the early solar system is that there are a lot of collisions, a lot of stuff ran into other stuff. And here's a simulation of two objects running into one another in the outer part of the solar system, and after a while, they end up making Pluto and Charon. And so once folks discovered more moons, you just ran the simulation again, and you can make a few more moons. So we're probably looking at the remnants of a collision of two things, or maybe even three things, early in the history of the solar system that left behind the things that we now call Pluto and its moons. Hey, boom. Okay, so if you want to get to Pluto, you missed the boat. 
train left a while ago, it left in 2006, the New Horizon spacecraft on its way out to, to Pluto should arrive there July 14, 2015. They'll probably be on time to follow us the direct route to Pluto. It will do all sorts of great things. So next summer, oh, we should see summer 2015, some fantastic new images of, of Pluto and its environment. I, I am looking forward to that. It should be absolutely worth it. All right. And then it helps have the green circle around things, especially when you're at the telescope pointing and looking for something. And there's a nice green circle you want to point to. Here's an image of the sky. What you notice is the vast majority of these objects stay in the same position, except for this killer character there that became known as Sedna. There's a picture. There's an image of Sedna. Too very, not too big, about the same, a little bit smaller than Pluto, much smaller than the Moon, much smaller than the Earth, got this orbit. It goes out a long, long way. It's a strange, very elliptical orbit. Okay? Average is about 90 AU away. It's going to get its closest approach in 2075. Be ready. <laughs> It'll be only 76 astronomical units from the Sun. Sedna is this little thing here. That's its orbit. Okay, kind of crazy. Ah, uh, and then, oh boy, you, know, you keep doing this stuff, and wow, there's another. Great to have the arrow in the sky to tell you where to look. See another little thing. That's coral. And all of a sudden, now you say, well, let's put coral on a little moving map here. There's Pluto, there's coral. Ooh, those orbits look awfully similar. Same stuff. So Pluto's probably a little, of course, probably a little smaller than Pluto, um, but shares a very common orbit. Very similar. And you take spectrum of core, you do a bunch of things, you look at it, and it's got a bunch of methane in it, just like this. And then this one doesn't move, so it's a little harder, harder to see it is. But there is yet another one. This is our friend Eris. Combination of 16 years worth of observing. Uh, it goes out to about 70 astronomical units. Uh, it'll, the, that's it, sorry. It gets far away is 97. Closest approach would be 38 astronomical units in 2257. I don't tend to be around there. <laughs> but it's Eris. It's again, is another one of these same types of objects. So we get this one. Eris started out as 2003 UB313, really. But it joins a fun. Now notice its size, 2,600 kilometers. Pluto is about 23. Ooh, wee. Eris is bigger than Pluto. And so what happened in the early part of the 2000s is the discovery of a number of these objects, all of which shared orbits that were very similar to Pluto's orbit. Roughly the same distance from the sun, somewhat elliptical, roughly the same size, roughly made out of the same stuff. And so the conclusion was reached that Pluto is one of many objects that have that type of orbit. And so Pluto was demoted from being a planet to being a dwarf planet. And all of these are characterized now as, as dwarf planets. There are a number of them in the outer part of the solar system. They're absolutely very, very interesting places. We obviously haven't been there. We know very little about them, but they're made out of, this is a Pluto spectrum is the red, Eris' spectrum is the black, very similar, called methane. It even has a moon. Yeah, moons are so that is a journey through the outer part of the solar system. There is a lot we don't know, but a lot we continue to learn about the outer part of the solar system. The dwarf planets is just one aspect of that, a brand new discovery from the early part of the 2000s. The future holds, there's many more dwarf planets to discover. There's probably more comets to discover. There's certainly more comets to dig around on. And lots of things that we have yet to know about, about the, the moons of the outer planets. And so I hope you enjoy learning about the outer solar system. And next summer in July, pay attention to see what the Pluto Express has to tell us about a dwarf planet, but still a little bit more about the outer part of the solar system. Thank you very much for, for coming out. I'd be happy to entertain any, any questions. Thank you. We have some mics here, which we could pass to you if you raise your hand. So, Lili, uh, you mentioned about the asteroid. Uh, I mean, you suspect that asteroid was a uh, responsible thing.
that brought water on earth? Perhaps not, yes. So if, even if that happened, so we have a lot of water. I mean, uh, asteroid just 10 kilometers, they can't bring that much water on earth. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a lot of them, uh, and you're probably right. It's really hard to actually all of the water could have come from comets. Um, but if the formation of the solar, of the inner part of the solar system, particularly Earth, involves bombardment of a lot of these things, you can get quite a bit of water. Now, it is also true that water is probably locked up in some of the asteroids. Since asteroids are also building blocks in the solar system, we can assume that the original material out of which the Earth formed had water in it. And so that water, as you get the secretion process, eventually melts and you, and you get liquid. But whether it's the same chemistry as the water in comets, that's going to be an interesting question. I, uh, I just um, I was wondering, you know, because you showed the Saturn Cassini encounter and the, uh, if you like, the northern uh, north pole of Saturn, a remarkable hexagonal structure, very symmetric, you know. Uh, it's really intriguing. What is it? Like, what does it represent? Or is it just an artifact of uh, some imagery or uh, Saturn North Pole? Oh, yeah, so uh, by a hexagon, you know, so. it, is, it is, I don't know if it's an artifact. Uh, it was sort of the first time, so Cassini has been largely orbiting in the plane of Saturn, but recently said, well, you know, it's still working, let's tilt that orbit to go over the poles. Um, and so we're still learning about what's going on with poles. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Just something else to keep in mind, that most of the observations we have of things are sort of from the equator. Uh, they go over the pole. Now that, that's kind of neat and, and new. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, there was a photograph here, there was a graph that you showed in your talk about starlight coming and then there's Pluto in between and there's a drop, or there's a change in its yep. uh, spectrum. Uh, can si such a similar technique be actually used to find certain star and planet systems outside the solar system? So the, the technique of a, um, uh, uh, it's sort of an eclipse. So as I'm standing from, from you, right, as a planet moving around another star comes in between you and that background star, it will block out some of the starlight. And so if we can measure that change in the brightness of the star, that tells us there's a planet there, especially if you can do it over and over again and see it every, whatever the orbit of the planet is. So that's how actually we've detected most of the planets we know about around other stars, is through this method. Now, as you notice with the one we did here, if this drop has a certain shape to it, you can begin to imply that it might have an atmosphere. This requires really good image quality, right? You better have really good measurements. But indeed, having hints of atmospheres around other planets comes exactly from doing this same experiment, but as a planet is going around with a star. Exactly the same thing. Now the other neat thing you can do if you're doing this against a star is if you take a spectrum of the star while the planet's in front of it, the planet's atmosphere will add an absorption feature to the spectrum of the star. And then, then you're doing real, real good stuff because you say, wow, look, there's some sodium in the atmosphere of that planet. And there are some planets where, we, where folks have done this for and detected some sodium Nothing that looks like the Earth, right? So that's the great thing. You love, you could be famous, famous. If you go and observe some planet, you say, that's an atmosphere, or that is, you know, 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. <laughs> You'll get really famous, okay? I guarantee, guarantee you that. Hello, sir. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. We say that life is one of the most confirming evidences of uh, what is one of the most confirming evidences of life. Water, is, we, as we understand it, water is required for life. Yes. So, uh, though we have a lot of lots of ice in the outer parts of solar system, though we don't have a very confirming evidence of life or microbial life in the solar system outer parts. Mm -hmm. The next question is: Can you please uh, give some features of uh, Kuiper belt? Okay, um, so the question about life. So life requires a couple of things, critical things. You have to have the raw materials. You have to have the organic materials that we think of, that we know about in life. Lots of, well, we understand like a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogen. We have that in the solar system. There are actually detections of organic molecules at various places in the universe. So that, that's not unusual. We have liquid water, we think, in Europe. We need to have that. 
You also need to have a source of energy. Uh, for those of you who are physicists, you can think about life is a system that violates entropy. Right? Entropy wants to make things, you want to increase your entropy. Life is very organized. So to overcome the natural tendency to increase entropy, you have to input energy into the system. So life requires some source of energy. We might have that out of your rope. All that tidal energy, if you can find some microbes that could... could. So you, the pieces are there, right? If you want to put it together and say, hey, there may be something there. So it, we don't know. We don't know. But you could imagine, and folks imagine, like you go into your rope, you flip on the ice, you get down to the bottom, and you find some microbes that love that kind of environment. You know, one of the neat things about, about thinking about life in, in space, and actually one of the classes I teach in Wisconsin is called Life in the Universe is fundamentally, we think about microbial life from a scientific point of view. That is, is what's really fascinating, because microbial life on the Earth can exist in these remarkably bizarre places. Okay. You and I, we have to have the service, we gotta have our sunlight, we gotta have our oxygen, otherwise we're not gonna be here. But microbes, they can exist in the bottom of the ocean around some vent, feeding off of geothermal energy well, without a drop of sunlight. Uh, so life can be in really, really strange places. Can it be in Europa? It's an open, open question. Uh, the Kuiper Belt, what did you... Uh, some basic features, main features. Main features, oh boy, it is, it's relative, there's a lot of particles that are relatively low mass. The total mass is maybe the total mass of Mars, of these things. Uh, they tend to be a few kilometers in size, maybe up to 100 kilometers in size for most of the Kuiper Belt. Um, there are icy and rocky. One of their really interesting features is that, and I thought about it, talking about this, the distribution of the orbits of the Kuiper Belt are very strange. And what they indicate is that early in the history of the solar system, Neptune migrated upwards. So Neptune did not form where it currently sits. It formed closer into the sun and migrated outwards. And that process of migrating outwards dynamically stirred up a lot of stuff. And you start tossing particles everywhere. And they end up in certain protected orbits. And the Kuiper belts lie in these protected orbits, as if they were scattered by this motion of Neptune. Uh, and there is a very interesting, the, the latest, best model for the early history of the solar system was compiled by a bunch of folks who were working in, in Nice, Italy, or France. Uh, so it's the Nice model. Uh, and that calls for. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to undergo a bit of a dance. And that Saturn, Jupiter starts to move a little bit. That triggered Saturn to move a little bit. That combination started stirring up a lot of those small particles in the outer part of the solar system, which sent most of those objects to the inner part of the solar system. If you look at the Earth's geological history, the Earth went through what we call a period of late heavy bombardment. Something like 400,000 years after formation, there was a flurry of impacts, probably driven by the stirring of going on in the outer solar system. And that process also shifts Uranus and Neptune out of the world, which again stirs up the pepper. So those of you who like dynamics, fun stuff to play around with. Conservation of angular momentum, conservation of energy. Uh, if there's any professors in the crowd who want to sign a homework problem, <laughs> you can ask your class to figure out how many small objects you need to scatter for Jupiter to go from, say, 5.5 astronomical units to 5 astronomical units. Then we've got to conserve angular momentum for the system. We've got to conserve some energy. It's a great problem. Sorry, students, if you ever have to do this. <laughs> My students hate that. Anyway, um, so yeah, it, it's an interesting, interesting place. I saw one uh, slide indicating the internals of the planets. Yes. So how we uh, come to that uh, conclusion that uh, Jupiter must be like this and <laughs> I don't want to say guesswork, but but what do you what do you know? You know a total density, right? You know mean density because you know a mass and a radius. Um, you also know how it spins. So you have something called you know the the moment of inertia, and the moment of inertia tells you something about the distribution of mass within within the object. So from that, you can say, well, my distribution of mass, my distribution of density has to be such. I can then assume, given my outer composition of mostly molecular hydrogen, 
that I have to have some dense material within a certain radius of the interior. So let me assume then that there's some rocks in there to account for the moment of inertia and the gravitational field of, of Jupiter. Um, one of the amazing things you learn when you send a spacecraft around a planet is because you know the mass of the spacecraft exactly. You built the thing, you know what its mass is. You know its orbital properties exactly. So therefore, to very high order, you can measure the gravitational potential of the object you're moving around. And you get a very nice map of what the mass distribution must be within that object to give you that gravitational potential. So from that, then you, you say, well, it's probably ice and rock over a certain range. But we don't have a probe that's gone down there to actually measure the stuff. But that's how you do it. You do it from afar. Yep. You take a last question. Uh, okay. Professor, I wanted to ask uh, what does the gravitational force of the planets have an effect on the temperature gradient of the moons? Like in, in compared to Io or Titan, there should be some gravitational influence of, on the temperature gradient as well because volcanoes or either water is erupting out from the surface. So is there any relationship? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can fairly easy calculate what the tidal force largely due to, to Jupiter and the other moons have on, on each one of the moons. And it clearly falls off with distance from, from Jupiter. So Callisto, the tidal forces are very weak. It is probably solid all the way through, probably cold, has not had any liquid water or the volcanoes. Io, being the closest one in, is subject to the largest forces, and so therefore it's the most molten. And it's a very clear gradient on the properties of the interiors of those moons as a function of distance from, from Jupiter. So that, yeah, and Titan is actually probably kept warm by the tidal forces of its orbit going around, around Saturn, which probably helped kept that, that somewhat molten interior and to generate an atmosphere. One of the things about atmospheres, particularly Titan's atmosphere and even the Earth's atmosphere, they're probably largely generated internally. So the gases that were once trapped in rocks and solid material get released when things heat up. And so if I can keep the interior of Titan molten, I can keep gases coming out and maintain an atmosphere. But it's a very, very clear correlation with, with distance. Thank you. For okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Amazing uh, and very complex looking in Cope in very simple language with the best of view graphics from you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. We also thank all of you for coming here and the 15 odd people who are joining us online. So this talk is being webcast live That's also. Right. So we thank all of you and hope you'll keep coming. We announce our next lecture on Facebook, email, etc. So please uh, keep a track of that. Thank you and good night. Yeah.